afternoon, and welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. I'm retired Air Force Major Lloyd Bryant, and I'll be master of ceremonies for today. Today, we officially open the newly redesigned and expanded Tuskegee Airmen exhibit, which tells the story of airmen who served with distinction in combat and contributed to the eventual integration of the U.S. Armed Forces with the Air Force leading the way. This new location has allowed the National Museum to gather together artifacts that have been on display in various exhibit areas throughout the museum in the past and portray them in a much more prominent and appropriate area of the museum's storyline. Along with the newly restored PT-13D, you will hear more about that in just a little bit from our museum historian. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please stand as the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Honor Guard posts the colors, followed by the singing of our national anthem by retired Air Force Technical Sergeant Polita LaRock. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallant. Streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that? star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base Honor Guard and Technical Sergeant Felita LaRock. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to begin by introducing our featured speakers. They're seated just here on your right. First, the director of the National Museum of the United States Air Force, Lieutenant General Retired Jack Hudson, and he's joined by his wife, Marcia, General Hudson and Mrs. Mrs. Hudson. We are very honored to have with us today on stage an original Tuskegee Airman, Lieutenant Colonel Retired George Hardy. Colonel Hardy. Colonel Hardy boasts quite a career, having been a pilot of the P-51 Mustang in World War II over Germany, the B-29 Superfortress in the Korean War, and the AC-119 Stinger during the Vietnam War. Colonel Hardy, thank you for being here today. The Chief of Organizational Histories at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, a distinguished author and researcher, Dr. Daniel Hallman. Dr. Hallman. and the National Museum of the United States Air Force historian and the curator of the Tuskegee Airmen exhibit, Dr. Jeff Underwood, Dr. Underwood. <laughs> we have many distinguished guests with us today from the community, the military, and industry. And as I introduce some of our guests in the audience, please know that we are truly appreciative of all of you who have come out today to help us celebrate the opening of this exhibit. I'd like to start with our most honored guests and the subjects of our exhibit, our Tuskegee Airmen. We're very honored to have with us Tuskegee Airman Donald Elder. They're right on the front row here. Charles Feaster. Charles Feaster and his wife, May. Robert Harvey. Edward Willett and his wife, Mary. And we've already met Lieutenant Colonel George Hardy. And finally, the widow of C.I. Williams, Grace Williams. All right. Thank you all for being here today. Now, I would like to recognize a number of other people in the audience, and there's a fairly large number, so if we hold our applause till the end, that will be good. Let me begin with the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center Commander, Lieutenant General John Thompson. From the Air Force Material Command, the Vice Commander, Major General Brent Baker and his wife, Rob Lee. The Commander of the 88th Air Base Wing, Colonel John DeVilliers. The Commander of the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, Colonel Leah, uh, Leah Lauterbach. The Chairman of the Board of Managers for the Air Force Museum Foundation, Mrs. Fran Dunce. Just recently joining the Board of Managers and the former commander of the Air Force Life Cycle Management Center, Lieutenant General Retired C.D. Moore, the Mayor of Dayton, Nan Whaley, the Mayor of Beaver Creek, Brian Jarvis, the Mayor of Fairborn, Dan Kirkpatrick, the Mayor of Germantown, Steve Bader, the Mayor of Riverside, Bill Flouty, and the Mayor of Xenia, Marcia Bayless. Here representing Senator Rob Portman, Mr. Robert Braggs II and Ms. Connie Logg, Representing Congressman Mike Turner, Ms. Kelly Gears, and Ms. Tamara Hawes from the Wright family. The great grandniece of Orville and Wilbur Wright, Ms. Amanda Wright Lane. The Central Region Vice President of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, Mr. Marv Abrams. From the Ohio Memorial Chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, Mr. Edward Borast. And the owner of the beautiful Tuskegee Airmen Convertible Automobile, parked outside the museum today and tomorrow, Mr. Ernest. Rosser, thank all of you for coming today. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium our keynote speaker, Dr. Daniel Hallman. Thank you very much. I've been invited to say a few words about the overall history of the Tuskegee Airmen, and you'll hear more details about that from some of the other speakers. I appreciate this opportunity to speak about the history of the Tuskegee Airmen, some of which, some of whom are in our audience today. I am a historian at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base, where I've worked for 32 years. The Air Force Historical Research Agency is one of the most important repositories of primary sources of Tuskegee Airmen history including the histories of the groups and squadrons to which they belonged, 
their daily combat mission reports, and orders that awarded them such honors as distinguished flying crosses, air medals, and aerial victory credits. The Air Force Historical Research Agency is located, as I said, at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. The Tuskegee Airmen were the first black pilots in American military history. They began training in 1941 at Tuskegee, Alabama, hence their name. They received primary flight training at a contract flight school at Tuskegee Institute's Moton Field, which is now the site of the Tuskegee Airmen National Historic Site. They received their basic and advanced flying training at Tuskegee Army Airfield, a much larger field of the Army Air Forces under the command of Colonel Noel Parrish. Tuskegee Army Airfield was several miles to the northwest of Moton Field. At the end of the war, its three largest hangars were disassembled and moved to airports at Montgomery, Clanton, and Troy, Alabama, where they are still in use. 992 black pilots graduated from flight training at Tuskegee Army Airfield, including 930 future fighter and bomber pilots, 51 liaison pilots, and 11 service pilots. When flight training ended at Tuskegee in 1946, at least 10 other African-American military pilots trained at other airfields and were assigned to Tuskegee Airmen units before the integration of the Air Force in 1949. If you also count them, there were more than 1,000 Tuskegee Airmen pilots. Not all the Tuskegee Airmen were pilots. For every pilot, there were more than 14 on the ground who were not pilots. There were navigators, bombardiers, radio operators, armorers, maintenance personnel, administrative personnel, training personnel, and other ground support personnel. There were well over 14,000 Tuskegee Airmen total. The first black flying unit was the 99th Pursuit Squadron, later renamed the 99th Fighter Squadron, which deployed to North Africa and then moved to Sicily and the mainland of Italy in, in 1943. The 99th flew P-40s at first with the 12th Air Force. In early 1944, three other black flying squadrons assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group, deployed to Italy, and at first flew P-39s, also with the 12th Air Force. At first, the 332nd Fighter Group, like the 99th Fighter Squadron, flew patrol missions to protect Allied surface forces in and around Italy, and that's where the Tuskegee Airmen scored their first aerial victory credits. In the summer of 1944, the 99th Fighter Squadron was assigned to the 332nd Fighter Group in Italy, making it the only fighter group in World War II with four instead of three squadrons. At about the same time, the 332nd Fighter Group was reassigned from the 12th Air Force to the 15th Air Force, and given the assignment of escorting heavy bombers such as B-17s and B-24s to targets deep inside enemy territory. For those missions, the 332nd Fighter Group at first flew P-47 and later P-51 fighters. To distinguish them from the fighters of the other six fighter groups of the 15th Air Force, the tails of the P-51s were painted solid red, hence the nickname Red Tails. The Tuskegee Airmen had an excellent combat record. They shot down a total of 112 enemy aircraft including three jets on a mission to escort bombers all the way to Berlin. For that mission, the 332nd Fighter Group earned a Distinguished Unit Citation. They flew 312 combat missions with the 15th Air Force between early June 1944 and the end of April of 1945, and 179 of those missions were bomber escort missions. Bombers escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen were shot down on only seven of those 179 bomber escort missions. A total of 27 bombers under Tuskegee Airmen escort were shot down by enemy aircraft, but the average number of escorted bombers lost by the other fighter groups in the 15th Air Force was 46. The Tuskegee Airmen lost significantly fewer bombers than the other fighter groups. 
the 332nd Fighter Group and its four squadrons demonstrated that they could fly and fight as well as any of the other groups. The 477th Bombardment Group was the only African-American bomber group in World War II. Since its pilots also trained at Tuskegee, it is also considered a Tuskegee Airman organization. It never deployed overseas to combat, partly because it was activated so late in the war. But an episode in its history is important in civil rights history. In April of 1945, 120 of its officers were arrested for refusing to recognize racially segregated officers clubs at Freeman Field, Indiana. The incident became known as the Freeman Field Mutiny. Eventually, all of the arrested Tuskegee Airmen were exonerated, but only after decades. The most famous Tuskegee Airmen of all was Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He was the, in the first class of graduates at Tuskegee Army Airfield and became the most famous commander of the 99th Fighter Squadron. He later became the most famous commander of the 332nd Fighter Group and later became the most famous commander of what became the 477th Composite Group. The 477th Bombardment Group, when it was given a fighter squadron, became a composite squadron. Benjamin O. Davis Jr.'s father was the first black general in the U.S. Army, and Benjamin O. Davis Jr. became the first black general in the United States Air Force. Another famous Tuskegee Airman was Daniel Chaffee James. He was a member of the 477th Bombardment Group during World War II, and he flew fighter missions in the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He eventually became the first black four-star general in the U.S. Air Force. In fact, he was the first African-American four-star general in any of the armed forces of the United States. Time does not permit me to say much more about the Tuskegee Airmen history, but I would welcome your questions after this event. The Tuskegee Airmen's exemplary performance during World War II disproved the myth that African Americans could not fly aircraft in combat successfully and encouraged integration of the military services, which in turn paved the way for the integration of American society. They truly deserve our praise and admiration because in more than one way, they fought so that others could be free. Thank you for letting me address you today. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is our own museum historian, Dr. Jeff Underwood. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Thank you for coming out and help us celebrate Black History Month through commemorating the Tuskegee Airmen with this new exhibit. This, orig this exhibit originally was at the museum in the 1970s. But I want to take just a moment to point out a lady who's here, Vivian White. Without her outstanding efforts, right over here, this exhibit would not be here. In the 1970s, she is the lady who went out and started collecting the photographs and the documents, the artifacts that end up becoming this exhibit. So, it's been... <laughs> We've had this exhibit on display since the 70s, but in 2003, with the massive movement of everything in this museum and our third building, which we're looking forward to our fourth building, it gave us an opportunity to expand the exhibit and put it in the timeline that fit for the World War II era. So, while we made it correct, and my colleague who actually wrote the initial second exhibit, He's currently serving in Southwest Asia as a reservist, so I'm going to give him, Dr. Doug Lanch, I want to give him a shout out because he did nice work. The exhibit opened in 2003, and we put it in the timeline for World War II, which made perfect sense for a historian. 
but in reality, the way the museum was laid out, we expected our visitor flow to go right by it. Visitors don't always do what we expect, and when they would walk around the corner and they would see things, and they would see the B-24 and the P-38 like moths to a flame, they would move the wrong direction. So, we knew this was a problem, and it was something we wanted to correct, and the opportunity came in 2013. That is when this aircraft, our restoration division, told us that this airplane needed to be restored. This is one of the finest examples of a PT-13. Now, yes, most of the Tuskegee Airmen were trained on the 17s, not the 13s. However, the 13 was used at the end of the war. With the director's permission and the support of, the, of our senior curator, we decided on taking all of this and turning it into one large full-scale exhibit. And that's what we've done. We decided to incorporate this aircraft into this exhibit. Now, it's not painted as it would have been at Tuskegee. It is painted exactly as it would have been rolling off the factory floor at Bowie. Because once it was delivered, every unit would paint it separately. Now, if you look around, you'll see we're kind of crammed in pretty tight right now. You're getting an example of what we at the museum, yes, this is a huge building, but every inch is precious to us. So if we can use this to tell two or three stories at one time, so much the better. We've done that, I believe, quite successfully. We've taken this and added the mannequins to get the point across that this is training from the Second World War, and this is the training second section of the Second World War, the World War II gallery. So after we've done this outstanding world-class restoration of this aircraft, which required stripping the aircraft down, cleaning it, putting new fabric that was period correct. It has the exact correct type of fabric covering it, redoping the aircraft, marking it correctly. And I want to take a moment to shout out to our restoration crowd. I don't, they're here, they're scattered around. I'm not sure who all's here. They did first class work on this airplane. So take a moment also to appreciate the quality that we can do at this museum, at this National Museum of the United States Air Force. So, you see the aircraft as it would have been painted, leaving the factory, it would have showed up at Tuskegee and been painted correctly, or wherever else it would have gone. It even, I'm sorry to say, has the Navy Bureau number and the Army Air Force's serial number. The Army people would immediately painted out. That would probably have been the first thing they've done, but it is on the aircraft to be historically correct. And the second thing we had to do, once we decided to do this aircraft, was we had to make room. It was originally hanging. And as you can see, it takes up a large footprint. So we had to move the aircraft around, decide where things were gonna go, move some of the other exhibits. This is a massive undertaking for our staff, and this is a long-term process that works pretty well. We've gotten very, very good at doing this. So I was tasked to revitalize this exhibit, and with the help of Dr. Hallman, who helped me and gave me information and kind of did quality check on my work, just to make sure. Never hurts to have a second pair of eyes outside the organization look at it. I put the text together. We collected artifacts that were on display at other places that they fit in the story of the time, but I think it makes a much greater story to put them together. And the impact is greater by having all the Tuskegee story in one place so everyone can see it at one time as they come through the museum. So once they're pulled together, our collections management people, and let me give uh, a, nod, a nod to Jen Meyer, who's our conservator. She took some of these artifacts, which realistically, when people went home from the war, they wore their jackets. They took their stuff home and they used it until they actually donated it to the museum. And some of it, I must admit, looked pretty rough, but with her really expert efforts, we brought these artifacts back to life and so yes they look like they're old but then that is why people come to museums is to see old stuff not shiny brand new things so she did a nice job with that and then our exhibits division are you getting the point that this is a team effort uh, the Tuskegee Airmen can tell you about team effort because it was not only the pilots not only the ground crew it was also the people they had to get paid someone had to do that 
Someone had to take the photographs. Someone had to control them while they were landing. It was a team effort by all of these men and women, too, during the Second World War. But our exhibits people have designed this area and used the area, and John Waddell from the Museum of Exhibits Division, who's back in the back somewhere, he's the one who did the layout and did the design, and I really like what he did this time. He's uh, tied in elements of Tuskegee's red tail with the old and the little red lines, just to get the point across, so in case you missed it the first time, we get you the second time you look at it. And our project manager, Jeff DeFord, he made sure that all these aircraft were moved. While I was doing this part, he was doing this part. So again, this is a team effort. And we had the support of the director and our senior curator to get this done. So now that we're up here, and I guess you've seen our public affairs people helping the media walking around, those of you who came in earlier, and you've seen, you've met our special events people. That's how this is put together, and that's how we get the word out to help people commemorate Black History Month. And I think we've done a pretty good job looking at the crowd that's uh, attending tonight. I'm quite pleased. So finally, the last people have to work on this is our education division. They have to make sure that this is incorporated into education programs because as we have children in the audience, we also have children around the world who use our website and take the lessons plans and the lessons that we teach here and go with it from there. So thank you very much. And when you get a chance, enjoy the exhibit. Thank you, Dr. Underwood. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our next speaker, Tuskegee Airman, retired Lieutenant Colonel George Hardy. Colonel Hardy. Thank you. I want to, speaking for Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, which is our national organization, I want to express appreciation to the museum and all the people in the museum who worked on this exhibit. I think it, the pictures are great, a, a good representation of the pictures, and particularly one picture there that I like, because I have a real d direct connection to several people on it. I like that, and I particularly like this big sign, the big name on it. So I think it goes very well. Now, I love this museum here. This is the second time I've been here. I was here last summer. I was invited to the opening of the gunships in Vietnam uh, exhibit. And every, there's so many airplanes in here. You could spend days going through this museum and learning about what is here. And so I appreciate this effort. And as Tuskegee Airmen, we appreciate the fact that you're gonna be here. And with the thousands of people that come through here every year, so many more people will understand that the Tuskegee Airmen were there and they did their job. Now, I headed the research committee for Tuskegee Airmen for many years. And so I'm always looking for problems and what things are said. Now today we had the picture, Red Tail Reborn. And again in that picture they made a mistake which I didn't like. They're talking about the birth of the Tuskegee Airmen. When we talk about the birth of the Tuskegee Airmen, the first thing they said, the pilots reported to Tuskegee Institute in July of 1941. They missed it again because the Tuskegee Airmen really began at Chanute Field in March of 1941. That's when the 99th Pursuit Squadron was activated, and in that Pursuit Squadron were assigned a little over 240 young African-American men to start training for maintenance on Army aircraft. Now, when you talk about a flying squadron, you better get the maintenance people because no pilot's gonna fly without maintenance. And so they started in March of 1941. And a picture today didn't mention that. They started with the pilots in July of 41. And to me, that's a bit of history that's missed. Now I bring that up for several reasons. One, those people who reported there in March of 41, they finished their training in the fall of 41, and Tuskegee was still being built. So on a temporary basis, they shipped them to Maxwell Air Force Base. And they were there for four or five days, Maxwell, waiting to move to Tuskegee. 
they finally moved to Tuskegee, and I think a few of the people there slept in tents because the barracks were still being built. Now, I want to stress that point because it was the maintenance people who were there first as far as Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, which later became the 99th Fighter Squadron. And at this time, I'd like to ask Charles Feaster on the first row to please stand. Charles was one of those individuals in that group that reported to Chinook Field in March of 1941. And I say, when we talk about original Tuskegee Airmen, that's an original of the original. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> uh, now, I, I don't like to get these things too personal, but I've just got to because of that picture over there. There's a picture on the wall here. It shows the 99th uh, Squadron fighter pilots leaving their briefing room or whatever, going out to fly. And I bring that up because there's several people in there who are very important to me in my life. When I went overseas and started flying in March and April 1945, I was a young guy. I was one of the young guys. I was 19 years old. And when you talk to a squadron, the older people in the squadron, experience-wise in the squadron, the ones who have the airplanes. Now, you have many more pilots than you have airplanes. So us young guys had no airplanes. So when the mission was called, the older guys got their airplane that was in commission, and us younger guys got what was left over. So I might fly a C model today, a D model tomorrow, and that's where it was. But to follow in that picture, Wendell Lucas on the end, he, flew, he had flown his missions and he could have gone home, but he stayed there to become an operations officer and a possible promotion. And I was one of the young guys in early uh, March, and one day he said to me, George, you want to fly my airplane? And I jumped at the chance. He had a D model, beautiful D model, number A33, tall in the saddle was the name on it, with a beautiful Varga girl on it. And most of my missions were flown in that airplane. So he says I was flying his airplane. In my mind, I was flying my airplane. <laughs> and so on our business card, I have A33 on it. It became my airplane. And that's Wendell Lucas. On the other end of that same picture is a fellow named Richard Harder. He was my flight leader in 99 for a while. He was captain. But after the war, we got to know each other very well. And he, when he got out of service, he and his wife moved to the Bronx, New York. I, in Philadelphia, I didn't go to Drexel. I applied to New York University School of Engineering because there was a young girl there who was going to graduate school, the Juilliard School of Music. I fell in love with her, and I went up to M47, started school, and we got married. And so that changed my life. And that fellow, Richard Harder, he and his wife stood with us when we got married. And we both went out into the service, and over the years, we kept in touch with each other. When our families are close together, we'd get together. And when his daughter was christened, the fellow Rod Rogers, who he wanted to be the best man, wasn't there. So I stood in for Rogers. Today, his daughter calls me her godfather, and, and she will forever. But Rip Harder, he's still alive. He's a few years older than me. He lives in San Francisco. And all these years, we still contact each other at least every couple months and talk. His health is sort of going downhill. But you, you, the situation we were in with segregation and all that, you, you develop these bonds which last a lifetime. And I appreciate of that. And so, again, I would say that Tuskegee Airmen, we really appreciate the effort put forth by the people in the museum here. And we feel that this will continue to spread the word that we were there. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Hardy. And ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to invite to the microphone the man who is in charge of all of this marvelous stuff, General Jack Hudson. Well, thank you, Lloyd. Well, welcome to all here today. And uh, of course, um, special welcome to our uh, Tuskegee Airmen today, uh, family and friends. We're especially glad that you're here all of our senior officials, military and civilian, um, 
folks from local communities, uh, all of you. If you can see what I'm looking at now, this is uh, absolutely amazing and uh, well-deserved as well that you all are here today. So thanks for being here. Um, here we are in the ceremony. Let's all of us keep in mind that uh, even at this moment today, we have about 25,000 airmen deployed around the world and tens of thousands from other services. So let's keep all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, our civil servants who are deployed and the support personnel. Let's keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers and their families, uh, especially those in harm's way. Well, great job also by uh, Tech Sergeant Felita Barak and our honor guide. They were just absolutely superb today. Um, here at the museum, good things are happening. There's a lot going on, and uh, we're just as busy as ever. Uh, if you happen to look behind the current main complex here, the fourth building is under construction. The backbone is there, it's in place, and they're working hard uh, to finish that building off later this year. Last month, we opened up the exhibit on the tactical air control parties back in the Cold War gallery in our Battlefield Merriman section. And it was a wonderful ceremony, just like this one. Our mission here is to tell the Air Force story to the American public and to inspire our young people. And like every other Air Force unit out there, there's more than we'd like to do than we can actually accomplish. So it's a matter of prioritization. And so we prioritize in accordance with what best suits the mission that we have and what we're able to do. And so the decision a couple of years ago to move the exhibit, to expand it, to improve it, to have it here, to take care of the PC-13 uh, was absolutely appropriate. And we planned it out to be ready for this month, Black History Month in February of 2015. And by gosh, the team did an absolutely awesome job pulling it off, pulling it off as you heard um, described earlier. Uh, the new expanded exhibit really, really improves our ability to tell this crucial story to the American public and to inspire our youth. How does it do that? Well, we've got lots more information here. Lots more of the story is available to any visitors that come through here. And when we get this photographed in the high definition panoramic uh, photography and get it on the virtual tour, the four million plus that look at the museum's website as well as the more than a million that come through every year will be able to learn um, the story. And after all, our motto, is, motto here is we are the keepers of their stories. And by gosh, it improves our ability to do that and tell that story to the American public. So we are really excited about this. So what about the inspiring our youth part? Well, how does that work? Well, I'll tell you how. All you have to do is walk through the exhibit here and look at the photographs. And you'll see young men. They're physically fit. They're working hard to do the maintenance, as was pointed out to be ready to fly the airplanes for hours at a time and do all the other work that was necessary to keep the squadron operational. They had to have good endurance because it took long, long hours and for long periods of time. So that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, they had to work really hard to understand how all the machinery worked. These were complicated platforms. It was complicated for maintenance to do their work. And the pilots, that was a complicated task to figure out how to fly these airplanes just right, to operate the weapons systems, to do all that needed to be done to be successful on their missions, and especially to be successful and reliable in combat. Thirdly, it's easy to tell from the exhibit here that their lives were in each other's hands. Uh, they had to trust one another. They had to know that the other person was trustworthy. The bomber crews had to trust and rely on their fighter top cover. And so it took character people of character, people of integrity, to have the trust from the, other, the others who were flying fighters and from the bomber crews. And so we hope and trust that exhibits like this provide inspiration to our young people, our young men and women, so they can look at the exhibits and say, by gosh, that is good stuff. I want to be doing things like that someday. Now, that could be in our Air Force, it might be another military service, it might be in a civil service, it might be as a productive in, uh, citizen in society. But we hope and trust that they see the pictures and read the text in, the text in this exhibit and see the artifacts and say, I want to be doing things like this when I grow up. And we hope that the spark catches in them to do three things. One is to take care of themselves and be physically fit, because you've got to be that to do 
missions like this and to do jobs like this. The second thing is work hard in school and work hard in training. So you can understand the science, the technology, the engineering and math behind the equipment, behind the operational procedures, and so you can succeed. And thirdly, that you stay out of trouble, that you develop good character so that eventually, no matter what you end up doing in life, whether it's military service or otherwise, that you can be trusted and that you will trust others. So we hope that the spark catches in our young people for these three things, um, especially in this exhibit. And when you extend that to other things that you see here in this museum, if you look around at the photos in the Tactical Air Control Party exhibit, pretty much anywhere else here in World War II, early years, Korea, Southeast Asia, Cold War, wherever you look, it's photographs and descriptions of what our young people have done who have carried the water for our nation, who have done the heavy lifting, who have got the job done, just like the Tuskegee Airmen exhibit tells that story of how our Tuskegee Airmen did that in World War II. So we're just really excited that uh, this has all come together here and for the grand opening today. And uh, please enjoy the rest of your time here. And as was mentioned, please partake of the exhibit. Check it out. You will like it a lot. Thank you. Thank you, General Hudson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the formal portion of today's program. We advise you to take time to view the exhibit that you've been looking at as the speakers have been speaking. And also join us for a reception located to your left down near the B-24 and the B-17.